You're listening to The Gutsy Podcast, where we talk about all things real, raw, and ridiculous about running a business authentically. I'm Laura Wallace, also known as the Laura Aura, lover of all things inspirational, owner of Works Graphic Design, and your host on this journey through entrepreneurship. I'm here to help you get out of your head and back into action as a passionate business rock star. Tune in every Tuesday and Thursday as we fuel your gutsy. We love to talk about money here on the Gutsy Podcast. And guys, it's such a secretive taboo topic. Like people literally shy away from it. You talk about money or you talk about budgets or you talk about spending and people just completely shut down. And in all transparency, I was one of those people too. Yet we all have it, some capacity of it. We use it and we're all challenged by it. So why do we not talk more openly about it? Well, today I'm really excited to have Diana Stone as our money expert. She has been studying personal finance for over 20 years and coaches people on building a budget. Now, I know what you're thinking. That's a dirty six-letter word. But Diana is here to tell us how it's actually permission to spend without guilt. I'm okay with that. It's all about creating a plan for getting out of debt and saving for the future. Diana, welcome to the Gutsy Podcast. Hi, I'm so excited to be here. I am excited to talk money with you. So you have um, been on such a beautiful financial adventure. And fun fact that I recently learned about you is that you've been in the Dave Ramsey world since 09 and got to meet him and tell him like a huge deal. So tell us about that experience. Why even, I actually, my husband and I used to live in Western Kentucky, so just a few hours north of Nashville. So we actually used to listen to Dave on AM radio. And for your younger listeners, that's just FM radio with really bad signal. (laughs) And you can barely pick anything up. And we started doing that in like the mid to late 90s. So I've been kind of drinking Dave's Kool-Aid for a couple decades now. Um, And then it was a really big deal. You know, when we go to Nashville, we'd time it so that we'd get into town during his show and we could switch over to FM. And we felt like we were we were really cool then. (laughs) But I started um, facilitating Financial Peace University in 09. And I've taught 10 years now. I think I've taught 11 classes. One year I did two. Yeah. So I've taught 11 classes. And it's just it's been amazing the, to see people that come into class hopeless and looking defeated. And nine weeks later, there's just that light in their eye and they see hope and they see light at the end of the tunnel. It's just, it's priceless. And I just love it. That's amazing. And then when you met him, um, one of the most recent times, you got to tell him some really big news of something that you guys paid off. I did. So our big goal was to get our house paid off um, as soon as possible. And we did it on Pi Day in March, which I never knew Pi Day was March 14th, but now forever, I will associate Pi (laughs) Day with the day we paid off our house. So a month one month after our 14 years that we'd moved in. So 14 years in a month, we paid off our house. And I, I looked at my husband, I'm like, it, it doesn't feel official. I'm like, we, we just have to go tell Dave. So we flew down to Nashville and met and told Dave. And then all of a sudden it felt official this summer when, when you know, he knew because, you know, he was waiting on it and all. <laughs> oh, well, of course. I mean, well, I think it's He's so been beautiful. following me and all. Of course. Absolutely. I mean, he was basically having dinner with you guys. Right. <laughs> I think that there's something so beautiful, though, about when somebody makes such an impact in your life that you take the time and actually communicate that. I think a lot of times we're thinking, oh, they won't care or, oh, they don't have time. But no, when someone's standing in their light and and pursuing their passion, they're able to make an impact like Dave made on you. I, I would highly, highly anticipate that he was like completely thrilled because he got to see the results of what he's been building as well. Yeah. And I think he was just as excited, if not more, because keep in mind, people probably tell him, you know, they paid off their house or paid off their car every day. But for me to be able to say, oh, and by the way, you know, I've been teaching your principles for the last 10 years, that actually excited him. Mm-hmm. So he was really happy to, you know, to meet a coordinator because there's thousands of us out there. But yeah, so that made it really fun. That's such a cool story. Well, I think that you have done what a lot of people are hungry to do, but maybe are feeling like they're a little lost or not sure how to get there. So I couldn't think of a better person to have a conversation with about money and budgeting. So let's talk about money. How did, like, how did you even get into it in the first place? Is it something that you just were born to do or something all of a sudden one day you woke up and you were like, and now I really love to talk about money. (laughs) 
You know, I think I always love to talk about it. Um, and my parents were the typical American parents that didn't talk to their kids about money. I mean, they just, parents don't. So we kind of only learn what we see them do. And luckily I saw my parents do really wise things with money. Like I can actually remember getting my first paycheck on my first job out of college. And back then, you know, they literally give you a live check and you had to go to the bank and cash it. And I remember thinking, what do I do now? Like, I have no idea. And I was like, you know, I would see my mom every payday, get envelopes from the bank and put money in different envelopes. Like, you know, one might've said mortgage or one would have said gas groceries. And I'm like, okay. So I literally cashed the check into a bunch of small bills, made the banker give me, you know, a half a dozen envelopes. And I went home and I just stared at him and I'm like, okay, how do I do this? Because again, nobody really taught me, but I was like, well, I remember mom always had a three by five card too. So I literally pulled out a three by five <laughs> card and started writing like rent, electric, cable, and writing it down and figuring out like, well, okay, this is how much I have. This is how much I need to pay bills. And that's just kind of how I started budgeting. Well, I, one of the biggest tips I will put out there that Dave taught me and man, when I made this change, it was, it was life changing. I used to always think for a budget, you take, well, this is how much I have. These are all my bills. And at the end, if the number's positive, yay, I win. Right. And I do whatever I want with what's left over. Right. Well, the principles he teaches, and it, it really is so powerful, is you should take your number at the top, do all your expenses, and that number at the bottom, the goal is for it to be zero. Because if it's a positive number, that means it's going to dissipate. You're just not even going to know where it went. So you go back up to your budget and go, well, okay, what am I working on? You know, am I working to pay off a debt? Am I working to save for an emergency fund? And you put that extra in that bucket. And then you do the math again and you get to zero. And once I started doing that, it was just, it was mind blowing. All of a sudden I made such huge traction because I gave every dollar a name. So that's a really, that's really interesting. Cause I never thought about it like that either. So let's say theoretically you have a thousand dollars left over at the end of the month, so to speak. So what you're saying is it's not left over. We're actually reallocating where that thousand is going, which is, does that tie back into then it's the permission to spend? Because if you want to go out to dinner more, you know, you can add 300 more to your going out fund, or if you're paying off a debt, you can shimmy it over there. It is exactly. And, you know, Dave's principles, and again, I've lived them, I've taught them for many years, so I'm a big believer in them, is he has certain baby steps. And if you're good with that, I'll go through them really quickly. Please, to kind of Okay, to tell people where to go. So there's six baby steps. So it's, I'm sorry, seven baby steps. So it's really simple. There's not a lot of them. But the first one is you create what's called a baby emergency fund of $1,000. And no, that's not a lot of money, but that's just enough to put a little cushion between you and life. So when you go out from work today and there's a hole in your tire, you can replace the tire. So you get $1,000 in a baby emergency fund. You put it somewhere where the pizza guy can't touch it. So don't mm -hmm. leave it at home in a drawer. You know, put it in a bank account. And then you add up for baby step two, all of your non-mortgage debts. And you're going to add them up smallest debt to largest. I don't care about the interest rate. This is the point in the conversation where people go, oh, nope, I got to know about the interest rate. This is about math. If it was about math, nobody would have credit card debt because they'd understand 13% interest is crazy. So we're taking math out of the equation. This is a behavior issue, not a math issue. So we line up those debts, smallest to largest. Maybe Visa's 100 bucks, maybe Discover's 400 bucks, maybe then it goes to student loans. So you lay those out. Once you have baby step one done, if you, in your example, you had $1,000 left over, so you would take that $1,000 and say, okay, boom, I just wiped out the 100 visa. I just wiped out the, I forget what number we gave it, what, 300, say, for Discover. And now you have 600 left. Where does that go? Well, that goes to your next debt. And maybe, again, it's just student loans. So it goes on to that debt. So the idea is to work through all of your debts, smallest to largest, until you get through baby step two. On average, that takes people 18 to 24 months. So it's, it's not quick, but it is so worth it. Once you get through those, you move to baby step three, 
which is to go back to your emergency fund and build it up to something substantial. You want three to six months of expenses in just a good money market. We're not investing this. This is your rainy day fund. It's not sophisticated growth stock mutual funds. It's just there for emergencies. And when I say three to six months, my recommendation is always if you're single or if you're a one income household, you really want to push closer to six months because if you lose that job, that's a big deal. If you are a two income household and you're both making about the same money, three months is probably okay because the odds of you, especially in different industries, losing your job on the same day are pretty slim. So you get that done. You go to baby step four, which is saving 15% of your income into retirement. Baby step five is saving for kids' college. Good news, if they're already grown and out of the house or you don't have any, that's a whole step you get to skip. <laughs> then you jump to baby step six, which is paying off the house early. Once you have the house paid off early, then you just give like no one else, which is baby step seven, which is a really fabulous step to be at. So to answer a very long answer to your short questions, you take that $1,000, ideally you put it back in your budget on whatever baby step you're working on. But yeah, if you decide, hey, we're going to go on a great vacation next month, I want it for vacation line, great, just give it the name. I want to eat out more. Okay, put it in that bucket. But understand when that bucket's empty, you have to stop. Okay. And I think that's where a lot of like, what I would consider the 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 negative connotation of budgeting comes into play. It's like, oh, if I if I have a strict budget, then I can't get to do the things that I want to do. Because people often think budget means live in a cave and come out on triple coupon Thursday. <laughs> I don't care. I really I tell people this in the class all the time. I truly don't care. If you want to spend $15 a month eating out, it's your money. I'm not going to lose sleep at night. It's yours to do with what you want. Just know that you're doing it, own it, and be okay with it. But I can tell you from 20 years of coaching people and 10 years of teaching class, hands down, the middle class is always either driving their retirement or eating their retirement. It never fails. And I tell people that in class. And then their homework that week is to work on their budget. And they all come back and look at me and go, how did you know? Because they're either eating their budget or their retirement or they're driving their retirement. And I'm like, because I've done this for a while. This is what <laughs> happens with middle class. Wow. I mean, when you break it down, it, it seems so simple. <laughs> it does. I'm telling you, car payments, I, I've honestly, I think I have changed the lives of baristas at Starbucks before. I have actually met people, had conversations with them about just don't ever, you know, you have a car payment, do this, do that. I've gone back in weeks later and like, I didn't buy the car. I listened to you and I'm like, I promise you, I just made you a millionaire. That's all it takes is that one decision to get off the wheel of the car payment. Mm, yeah. So what, let's talk about car payments while you're on it. So okay. tell me about how just kind of your overall feeling about them. You know, a lot of us have them. Many of us don't. Why do we want to avoid those? And it is the norm. Absolutely. You know, and Dave always says that, you know, um, you know, debt is, what is it? Oh, I can't think. Debt is normal. Be weird. And, and it's such a, a truth because I don't know that many people that stroke checks for cars. Right. But I tell you what, the ones that do are in a very financially healthy place because people, we, we love our cars, especially with the launch of social media, however many years ago that's been now. Everybody's about, you know, I got to look the part. Well, the average car payment in America right now, are you ready for this? Is $545 and it's for 69 months. That's insane. And I think the statistics, something like 40 or 50% of them don't even get paid off before they turn around, they take that debt, they buy the next new shiny car, and they roll that loan into the new one. And it just keeps going. And if you, I actually, I did something for a presentation months ago, I wish I had it in front of me, but I did the average. And if you just, if you never made a car payment, but you took that car payment for the 40 years, a normal person works, say, 25 to 65, if you paid yourself that car payment into a good growth stock mutual fund, earning 12% interest, the number was something like $4.8 million. Oh, wow. And of course, I will always have financial people 
side note, I've been working in corporate finance for 20 plus years. So I work with all the accountants and all the numbers <laughs> people, but I always have someone who goes, oh, you can't get 12% in the stock market. Okay, First of all, you can, but that argument aside, if I'm half wrong, you are still a multimillionaire. Just don't do the car payment. You really can save up and pay cash for a car. That first one is not going to be glorious. It may even be a little embarrassing. But you you know, if you take what you're paying for a car payment once your car's paid off and you take the next year and you keep making that car payment to yourself, whether it's 300, 500, whatever the number is, say it's 500, that's easy math for me. That's $6,000 you've paid yourself for that car. Take that $6,000 and the car you're still driving, turn them in and upgrade in car $6,000. Do that for another year, two more years, and upgrade again. You can slowly be driving nice, you know, $15,000, dollars dollars cars that you've slowly paid for yourself. And you put that money into a good mutual fund so then when you save that up, it's made interest and you will get to a point in life where the interest is buying you new cars. Mm. Now, no, it's not a new $80,000 Mercedes every 16 months, but every five to seven years, you can buy yourself a nice 20 some thousand dollar car, (laughs) but it's just, we're, we're an instant gratification culture, especially again with social media. You know, I was telling someone just recently that 20 or 30 years ago, if you saw someone driving down the road in a Mercedes or they had the latest, you know, high end purse, you kind of knew they were rich and they are wealthy, I should say. And they really were like that was the norm. Nowadays, there's so much fake rich out there and people trying to keep up on social media that they get sucked into it. And I'm constantly trying to teach that lesson to my daughter. I'm like that Gucci belt doesn't mean rich, you know, or doesn't mean they have money. It, it could very well mean debt. You have to kind of navigate through that. Yeah, that's the thing. I, I think that sometimes we have to remind ourselves that you can, be, you can be struggling with finances or and have the same debt issues as someone who has a lot of finances. But if their debt is just as, if the ratio of debt to income is the same, whether you make 10,000 or a million, Debt is debt. So the, exactly. the weight doesn't go away. <laughs> it just gets bigger. It does. And I tell people all the time, it truly doesn't matter if you make $20,000 a year or 200000 It matters how you spend it. Because if you're really bad with a $20,000 salary, you can't out earn dumb. People think that all the time. Well, I'll just make more money. Well, here's the thing. You make $200,000 and keep the same habits you had. You'll just do dumb with bigger zeros. It, you mm. won't fix it because again, we're not fixing a math problem. It's 80% behavior and it's hard. I'm not going to lie. Like paying off the house, it was hard. There was a lot of times we didn't go out with friends. We didn't vacation. But I'm like, you know what? I want to retire young. I own the prize. I'm focused. I'm doing this. And it it was a team effort for sure. We had oh, a yeah. debt-free chart on our fridge and every payday when we could put extra on that house, we had a chart where we just colored in the line and we watched it grow. We had a 15-month plan to pay off the last $50,000. And we got so intense in the end. We did it in nine months. Wow. A lot. That was a lot of... You have food at home. Just go home. Don't eat out. There's food in the house. And it it was painful. But I'm telling you what, the day that we popped the cork on the champagne and told Wells Fargo to hit the road, oh, it was so worth it. Oh, yeah. Because, I mean, when you're in that moment, it seems like forever. But now you literally have have forever now, you know, unless you would go buy another house. Um, That expense is gone. That debt is gone. Your income is your biggest wealth building tool. So you've got to free it up. But Americans are, and this again, it's normal, but 78% are living paycheck to paycheck. So they're bogged down with student loan debt, with mortgages, with sometimes two car payments in a household. They wake up at 35 and go, oh, we should start thinking about retirement. Oh, we don't actually have any extra money to do that. And that's 35 is just somewhere, sometimes just seems to be the light bulb age where people are like, "Uh uh-oh. And then they need to start thinking about it where time value money, man, that's a big thing. Like my teenager understands that. And she started her first job last year at 16. And that same year she opened her Roth IRA because she's uh. like, um, I want to retire young. I'm like, well, this is what you have to do. You actually have to save now. And she's like, okay, I can do that. 
I mean, oh, really, she, she lives at home. Her bills are car insurance and gas. Well, she has a, a brilliant mama to guide her down that journey. And, it, and I think that goes back to what you were saying earlier is a lot of people just, we just don't talk about it, right? It's, we're all kind of figuring it out on our own. And uh, you hit the nail on the head because I'll be 35, you know, this December, just in a couple of weeks, actually. And just in the last like 18 months or so, I've been really looking at money and how my relationship with money and how I, how I use it and how I welcome it. And, you know, it's just, so you're onto something there with that magic and number. For I sure. didn't even know your age. So don't I look just like a genius now? <laughs> well, I mean, I think you're a genius. So. Oh, thanks. so I think that a lot of people get really stressed out, right? So we haven't talked about it for a really long time, if at all. And we're secretly, I'm saying we as in just the general public, you know, we're sitting in our home office or on the couch or with that pile of stack of, of, of mail that we refuse to open because if we don't look at it, then maybe it's not actually there. So I think a lot of people think, well, budgeting and getting out of debt is for everyone else. This is just how I live. So what do you, how do you typically coach people through when they're just feeling really kind of um, overwhelmed by it? Oh, and people are, they're so beat up. And the debt collectors that call you and break federal law every day, that could be a whole podcast. Uh, They're ruthless. They are Um, ruthless. (laughs) The first thing I always tell people in those situations is first, you know, open the drawer. It's not that bad. And of course it's metaphorically, but you talked about the pile of bills. So often people just will take those bills and like stick them in a drawer. And I'm like, look, we we just have to open the drawer and see how bad it is. Because it's normally not as bad as you've built it up in your head. And honestly, if there's 20 bills in that pile, there's probably only six. The rest of them are probably statements from prior months. You just didn't open. So (laughs) I'm like, let's clear out the chaos and look and see what we really have. And the key is to just put it all down. And I always tell people a budget is not a budget unless it's written down. It's in Excel. It's in an app. It's in something. I just laugh when people are like, I have a budget. Okay, where's it at? Let me see it. It's in my head. That's not a budget. (laughs) I need it not to be in your head. So you sit down and you just lay it out. Again, simple as pencil and paper if you want and say, okay, I owe Visa 100, I owe student loans 83,000, whatever the number is. And you write it down and go, okay, this is my truth. This is what I've got. Now let's look at our income because you've only got two options. What's coming in, what's going out. And if you do that income minus expenses and it's a negative number, you don't get to go, yay, it's positive then we've got to fix something. It's You've got to sell something. You've got to start delivering pizzas on the weekend and pick up an extra job. You have to sacrifice to win. So first, let's figure out where you're at. Are you negative, zero, or positive? And then you just kind of start building a plan from there. And the plan will just instantly give you such hope because you're like, okay, I can, I can do that. It's on paper. I see it. This is what I'm going to go do. And I cannot stress enough, please, 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 if you guys hear nothing today, hear this, start feeling cash again. We don't feel money because all we do is swipe plastic. You've got to start feeling money. That really is the biggest takeaway I tell people all the time. You want to look at that budget and go, okay, what are the categories I overspend on? It's normally eating out, groceries, entertainment, sometimes clothes. Those are normally the big ones. Those are ones that you can have cash for, like taking you back 20 years when I said, you know, all I knew is my mom got these envelopes and put cash in them. So I've always done that. And I think one of the reasons I was drawn to Dave is he actually teaches the envelope system. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I do that. I just didn't know it had a name. And really, like my kids growing up like that. So I have like a slot in my wallet for eating out. And since she was little, she could say, you know, can we go out tonight? I'd be like, nope, envelope's empty. She always knew what that meant. So then over the years, the language talked to, do we have any eating out money this week? Because <laughs> she knew that the envelope gets filled on Friday. And some days we're good all the way through Thursday. Other days on Sunday, I'm going, oh, yep, we're eating in all week. We went way <laughs> too big this weekend. But, and that was a number we decided on though. We're like, you know what? This is all we want to justify spending on eating out. Again, I don't care if it's a hundred bucks or a thousand bucks. Know it, own it, put it in your budget. But then when that envelope's gone, you've got to stop because- Statistics show that if you swipe plastic 
and I don't care if it's credit or debit, you will spend 12 to 18% more on your purchases because you've lost the emotional connection to money. I hand over $100 every weekend when I buy groceries. It hurts. I feel it. When you swipe, you don't. And in grocery stores, it's even more dangerous because that 12 to 18% statistic jumps to 18 to 24% that you will spend more in a grocery store. It's why credit card companies give twice the cash back on grocery stores. They're not being generous. They know you're going to spend up to 24% more on your purchase. You're probably not going to pay it off. And they're probably going to make two grand on that $4 that you got back at the end of the year. Wow. Their buildings will always be bigger than our houses. Don't try to outsmart them. They're better than us. Wow. That's mind blowing in its own. Uh, the losing emotional connection to money, like that physical, you're so right. Like when you physically are handing over, you know, twenties or fifties to the cashier, like you can actually physically see it going away. And not to mention in your wallet, when you open it up, you can physically see that it's gone. When you're swiping, like, Mm. <laughs> like most people are not immediately going and looking, you know, at their online banking or pulling up a statement or even that. I think that there's a disconnection there. I'm super. We just I'm, don't feel it. We just don't feel it. Oh man. It just ties into technology today. Um, I'm really curious. Why, why do we spend so much more at the grocery store when we use plastic? That's a, that's a pretty big jump rather than, you know, other everyday purchases. I don't know why I can tell you, you know, that the studies show that my guess of course is, you know, I know if I go in hungry, things look better. Mm. And when I, like, I love our local grocery store actually has a scanning app and I always use it. So when I'm picking up things off the shelf, I scan it, it goes into my cart and I can see where my budget is and I can see where I'm at. Cause I allocate a hundred a week for the three of us for groceries. So if, you know, I always joke that I go to the freezer section last because there might be room for Ben and Jerry's in my cart. There might not. It really, you know, whether my boys are making it in the cart, we don't know that week, but I can actually track it. Well, so often grocery stores don't have that technology. So people are just throwing things in our cart that look good. Oh, that sounds good. Oh, that's, that smells really good. Grab that. And I don't think they know their total till they check out. But if you know that, hey, that's going to be really embarrassing, like if I had to put things back, because, you know, being in you know my mid 40s, I can remember the times in a grocery store where people didn't really have credit cards when I was a little kid. And you'd see people put things back because they didn't have the cash. We don't do that anymore. We'll just overdraft all day long. We don't care. Oh, that's true. Because the overdraft fee sometimes is a lot easier to digest than... Um, what some might consider a public humiliation of having to put things back. Exactly. And mm-hmm. there's, I don't remember the exact number. I, th- I know it's in the billions. I think it's four point something billion is what um, the 2018 numbers showed that people spent on overdraft fees. I mean, again, that's why the bank buildings are so big. They're counting on you not reconciling your checkbook or having any idea where your balance is. Wow. Oh, I just have a whole new appreciation <laughs> for, for this entire topic today. <laughs> You brought up another topic earlier, which I know is a giant thorn in a lot of people's sides, and that's student loan debt. Can we just talk about that for a hot second? <laughs> yes, because I have been really, because I have a high school senior, I have really been studying that, and I've been listening to a podcast that I love just recently, and I'm, I'm fascinated by it because I was very fortunate. I went to I didn't have college debt. My husband didn't have college debt. So when we graduated college in the 90s, we thought we were broke. We looked at our friends that had student loan debts, went, oh, no, we're even. They're broke. (laughs) So, and now this culture, like the things I've learned in the last few months studying this, it's out of control. The student loan debt, oh, student loans are such, uh, I could could talk all day about those. But I think, and I'm only speaking from my perspective, but I feel like, particularly my generation. So the, you know, 30 to 35 year old people listening, um, I feel like student loans got really pushed across the table when we were applying to college. And it was like, oh, we'll help you here. Oh, we'll help you there. And when you're going into college, you're thinking, yeah, I need all the help I can get. I'll sign this paper that I have no idea what it means. And then 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years later, you're still talking to, you know, Navian or Sally Mae or, you know, whoever your student loans are through. So how do you typically work with people through, and I know it's one of Dave Ramsey's um, baby steps, 
But how do you typically work with people to get through their student loan debt? It really just gets rolled up in baby step two. So it's a non-mortgage debt, but yeah, it's been eye-opening. Um, and the podcast I highly recommend it. It's Anthony O'Neill and he's actually one of Dave Ramsey's, um, I don't know if you call him their talents. I don't know what they call him. He works for Dave Ramsey and he's one of their speakers, essentially. He's actually just put out a book that I want to get it and read it and I haven't yet. And it's called Debt-Free Degree. I've heard great things about it but have not read it yet myself. And the podcast he put out, I think it's only going to be for eight weeks. And again, you can only, I think, talk so much about student loans, but it's called Borrowed Future. And it talks about like student loan debt is $1.6 trillion. The eye-opening things that I didn't realize, and it was, it's your age group that this started with, because again, mine, a few of them had student loans, but they were really small. But I didn't realize in 05, Sally Mae got a law passed that basically said, hey, you can't even bankrupt private loans anymore. And to get these student loans, there were these 18-year-old kids, like you said, signing on the dotted line. They didn't know. Their parents probably weren't involved or understood it. Some even co-signed. By the way, side note, don't ever co-sign for anybody for anything. I, I promise the banks are smart. As a credit person in my personal life, the, as bank, we're smarter so if we need a co-signer, that means we know the person signing up for the debt's not going to pay it. You will be on the hook as a co-signer. Mm. But these people, I didn't realize the interest rates had gotten so out of hand. They're 12, 15%. You put it into, is it forbearance? I think it is. Yeah. If you've got like a hardship. The interest keeps accruing. I mean, I listened on the podcast this week. This one guy had 200000 in student loan debt, never missed a payment. And after eight years, his balance was two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Wow. You, the only way to dig out of that is to just get sick and tired of being sick and tired and dig in, but you have to get mad. You cannot wander out of six figure student loan debt. And that's, you know, middle class. I often say too, middle class is a challenge to coach only because they're not that uncomfortable. So when I, um, help some nonprofits in town that have, um, like lower income housing, And I've met with those people and they are just like, yep, I'll do whatever you say. And they are ready and they're on fire and they are kicking butt with a small income. But then when I work with middle-class people, they're like, you know, it's not that big a deal. It's a couple hundred dollars student loan payment. And it's really hard to light that fire because they're not uncomfortable. And you, you've got to get uncomfortable and mad to get out of that. It's a, it's a a great point as well. And sometimes to me, anyway, it's the most annoying thing that I pay every month. <laughs> oh, I <laughs> like, bet. Because I'm just thinking, like, really? We're still here? Like, we're still talking about this guy? So I've kind of been out of school for a long time. But, you know, time and circumstances, I wasn't always I wasn't always able to pay them. So I, too, got caught in the forbearance, um, you know, downward spiral, you know, and it just one thing becomes another. And then, you know, it's kind of sad to say and admit even out loud, but at some point you just don't really care. <laughs> you know, there's so many. used to it. You get it's, used to it. Yeah. It becomes, you know, the pet, <laughs> you know, it's just like the cat that wanders around my house. It's just yes. part of the, part of the house. Yeah. But I love that you say you just got to get mad to get out of it. And that's so it's true. It. And I think that's, I think that's really relevant in, in any circumstance in life. Um, I don't know that I ever put it together with money though. You know, you have to, or those breakdown, those breakthrough. So if you're willing to just like look at everything and put it all on paper and just like get pissed off at it for a hot minute and then, okay, now I can do something about it. Right. And that's um, the thing. So many people won't put it on paper. So they don't know. They just, they feel upset, but they don't have any hard numbers in front of them to even know what direction to go, which is why I can't recommend a budget more. Right. Because it just gives you that power. Well, and, and I have something that I have really learned and have adapted is you create the scenario in your head, you can create a monster out of it and thinking about it and worrying about it and not knowing, I think is where the majority of the stress comes from when you, when you're not in control of the situation. And even if you're not in control of how you're allocating money yet, you can at least be in control of knowing what there is to work with to start. Yes. But, but when you don't face it, you have no idea. So then you create a mountain out of a molehill. Yep. Which is why I always tell people first things first, you got to open the drawer. We've, we've got to look inside the drawer. 
open the drawer. So let's open the drawer. Let's get into building a budget. So okay. someone comes to you and you're like, oh my gosh, I, I've never built a budget. It's super overwhelming to me. I've got this drawer of stuff that I don't want to deal with. I don't even know how to begin. So once we figure out on like, say one side of the paper, we're going to say, these are all our debts. These are our debt payments. And you're just going to get that figured out. And now we're going to put it to the side and go, okay, what do I do in my life that like, you know, to sustain? And again, if you're in a situation where your net number is negative, then the first thing you do in order is you cover your basic needs. So your housing, whether that's rent or your mortgage, your transportation, because you got to get to work if you're going to have an income, your gas to do that, um, the electric, the water, basically just things that I need these things to survive and get to work. Those have to be at the top of your list. Because again, if you're negative, then at some point in this line, you're going to have to draw a line and say, okay, you people below the line can't get paid. And that's a reality. So you've got to start with necessities. And once you lay them out, you've got your food. I've got to throw that in there. We need to eat. Now we don't need to, you know, go to Outback every week, but we need to go to the grocery store. So you've got to have your food, your shelter, your transportation, possibly clothing that sometimes though can go a few months if you're in crisis mode. And then you start laying out, okay, well, you know, what else do I pay that's more in like the luxury category? You know, your Netflix, your internet, your cell phone, things that I could live without if I had to, if I lost my job tomorrow, but they're in my budget. I like them. I'd like to keep them. So you just lay all those out and people will always forget about things. And it takes about three months to stop beating yourself up and go, okay, I got this. Because the water bill, for example, that always comes once a quarter, people are like, yeah, I'm doing great month one. Yeah, I'm doing great month two. Month three, oh crap, I forgot about that. So people forget about those non-recurring bills. So it's really important to kind of have them off to the side, get a list and know when they're coming. Because nothing gets you quicker than those once a year bills that you forget about. You know, your car registration is due every two years in Maryland. You know, things like that are just going to come up. So it's important to have those laid out. And then again, income minus expenses. If you have anything left, you put it onto whatever baby step you're on. If you have a negative, you figure out who can't get paid that month. And please, for goodness sakes, pay the mortgage before you pay Discover. I realize that Wells Fargo is not going to call and beat on you like Discover is, but Discover is a monkey in a cube 800 miles away that is trying to invoke an emotion on you to get you to pay them. And you know what you're going to do? You're going to pay them and not pay your mortgage because people do it all day long and it's heartbreaking. And it's because Wells Fargo, I just pick on them because they were my mortgage company. They're going to be professional. They're not going to call and harass you, but a credit card company will. So you've got to take control of that and be able to just say, I'm sorry, you're under the line this month. You know, I will try my best to get to you next month, but hold your ground and know that, hey, I can't swing it this month. Again, if you're in a positive situation, put that extra money in whatever baby step you're working on. Hopefully it is, you know, paying off that student loan and kicking Sally Mae to the curb. Hmm. I, I think there's a lot of us like, lining up to kick Sally Mae to the curb. <laughs> um, I love, I think it's so important. And a lot of people think, well, if I just don't talk to them, then maybe they'll go away, right? Like there's, there's a, a bit of a naive situation around money and the communication around it. I've learned, and I'd be curious on your insight as well, of if you just pick up the phone, like actually just answer them, you know, that they will call ruthlessly, like I'm, until they can't anymore. But if you just pick up the phone and have a conversation and get a plan, a lot of times it silences that, at least for a little while. It will. And it puts you back in control because again, their goal is to either make you mad or scared because either of those emotions are going to make you go, okay, you know, here's my check routing number, take money and go away. So you have to be in control of that situation. And keep in mind, just like it, when you were a teenager and, you know, the boy didn't call and didn't call, think about all the things that you came up with in your head. That's kind of what Discover's doing. And I'm just picking on Discover today for no real reason, but that's what they're doing. They're sitting there going, she hasn't called, she hasn't called and they're thinking the worst. So if you just pick up the phone and say, look, you know, whether it's I've lost my job or whatever the situation is just, you know, with no emotion, do not let them control the conversation. Just say, I've done my budget. You're below the line. I cannot pay you this month. I apologize. How about we agree you call back next month? I'll let you know where I'm at. And 
see how they are. And the bottom line is if they're not respectful to you, if, and again, this is someone that I've spent just side note, um, working in credit in the corporate world for the last 15 years. So I am very well aware of, you know, fair debt collection practices act and what can and can't be done. But if they start to harass you in any manner or try to invoke that fear, just say, you're not going to speak to me like that. If you would like to continue communications, you can call me back and give them a date, give them a time and say, call back then. I'll see if my situation's changed. But just take control of the situation and do not lose your cool. Don't lose your cool because it's recorded for quality purposes. Right. <laughs> yeah, I I have found personally just a lot of peace. And again, you hit the nail on the head with taking back your power, taking back your control. And it's when that phone is constantly ringing, you know, we've been in that situation and it's ringing all day and all night and they're leaving messages and it just gets really overwhelming. But when you're in that headspace of, I don't know what they're going to say. I don't know if they're going to be mean to me. I don't want to admit defeat. I don't want to tell someone else publicly that I'm struggling. I think that's huge, right? Oh, absolutely. Because again, we're all hiding it. You know, everybody, when people come into my class that first week, they look around the room and go, oh, it's just me. And we do an exercise where they have to come back in and it's all anonymous and they have to write down what their non-mortgage debt number is, completely anonymous. I add them up at the end of the class and then I say, okay, here's the number for the class. And when they realize how big it is, it's that, oh, oh, it's, it's not just me. Okay. I'm not a failure. I didn't do something wrong. And then they just, again, they start to see a little bit of hope and they move forward because they're not in this alone. Yeah. No one's, I'm I'm a firm believer that no one's in anything alone. It's just whether we choose to be open and communicate about it. And that's why I always, I, again, I I will talk to the barista at Starbucks. I talk to (laughs) anybody and everybody about money because we should, I don't know how it became in society that nobody talks about it, but let's take all that weight off of it. Take its power away. It's, it's just a topic. It's just money. Now I'm not saying run around and tell people your net worth, but you know, (laughs) it's okay to talk about it. We had open enrollment at work today and someone started talking about insurance policies. And I totally looked at HR and said, I'm sorry, I got to hijack this for a minute. And I spent 10 minutes teaching people why, you know, an HSA is such an amazing retirement vehicle for medical savings. And and I looked back at her and I really didn't know she's going to be mad or not. And she's like, thank you. Would you be like the guest speaker on all my open enrollment meetings? (laughs) But I thought, great, because I, again, will tell anybody and everybody, I'm like, hey, you guys got to know this stuff and nobody teaches it. Right. I have a freaking accounting degree and an MBA. Do you know how many classes I took in school from kindergarten through grad school money? Zero. (laughs) Nobody even taught me how to balance a checkbook. You'd think with any degree, maybe accounting? Nope. Nothing. Really? Yep. And people always ask me when I started coaching years ago, they're like, what are your credentials? I'm like... I don't really have any. And they're like, well, you have to. I'm like, where, where would I get them? And I was like, I have an accounting degree. Does that make you feel better? And they were all like, oh yeah, that's great. And I'm like, yeah, but they didn't teach me crap about personal finance. Right. But it made them feel better for some reason. So I told them. Uh, That's what we're trained to, trained to know and believe. Yep. Accountants must be good with money. No, it's behavior. It's all behavior. I also love earlier that you cleared up, I think a question that goes through a lot of people's mind is, do I pay off the high percentage thing first or the smallest thing first? And you said list it smallest to largest and start start from the bottom and work your way up. Yes. And here is why. If you've ever been on a diet that first week, whether you're going to the gym a bunch or you're, you're starving yourself, whatever you're doing, at the end of the week, when you get on the scale and you've lost a couple pounds, do you not just feel so motivated and excited and you're just ready to conquer the world? Well, that is what happens when I'll keep using that $100 visa example. That's what happens at the end of week one. When you pay off that $100 visa, you are so excited and you're like, that's it. I got this. And you're ready to move on to the next one. And you get to take that minimum payment that you were given visa and now put it on Discover or whatever your next one is. And that literally gives you more money to keep fighting it and your momentum increases and your excitement and your will. And it's just, it's a beautiful thing. If you took $100 and put it on an $83,000 student loan debt <laughs> at the end of week one, would you give a shit? No. no. You just wouldn't. Now, it might have had the higher interest rate, but you'd have almost felt defeated. Like, oh, I starved myself all week and I 
I gained a pound. Yeah, that's how it feels. Yep. So that's why this is behavior. Because again, who would, and again, an 18 year old doesn't know, but who would sign up for 15% student loan debt if it was about math? But people do, they love it. They're just like, oh, I, I'm sophisticated. want to talk about math now that I'm getting out of debt. Well, where were you when you were getting into it? Because you didn't <laughs> care then. <laughs> Oh, so, so true. yeah, lowest, to, you know, smallest to highest, because it's going to build this huge momentum for you. And that's what you want. You want to see instant progress. And that little one is going to be great. Oh, it's such a huge, I mean, it's positive reinforcement. It's finest. And honestly, I kind of view it as a game then. Like I'm in my own personal game. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I, I beat level one. Now let's move on to level <laughs> two. And oh, just when something's been hanging over your head for so long and it can finally be gone. It's like the weight of the world off your shoulders. Absolutely. It's just, there's no describing the freedom you feel. And it's so worth the sacrifice of eating those damn leftovers when you just really (laughs) wanted to go out. Yeah. There's a great meme I saw recently that said 90% of my financial problems could be solved if I just eat the food I have at home. And I thought, uh, isn't that the truth? (laughs) Isn't that the truth? It's just so much easier. So, And they clean it up for you and it's a whole thing. (laughs) So I'm going to start to round this out here, but I would love to just kind of open it up if there's any other budget or financial advice that you feel like our listeners should have in their toolkit today. Well, the big thing was cash and we covered that. The only other thing since it's that time of year that I just want to throw out there is I know some people are going to be surprised by this, but Christmas is still in December this year. It didn't move. It is the (laughs) same day every year, but yet so many people are like, oh, well, well, Christmas, I, I didn't know that was coming. And little Jimmy needs a bunch of plasticky toys, or he's going to end up in his therapist's office in 20 years if I don't get him the right plasticky toys. And <laughs> that's just crap. And people, like, it's their just way of justifying, like, I have to go out and, you know, the consumerism and the shopping. And, you know, just if you're not there, if you're working on getting out of debt or your budget just can't swing it, I promise little Jimmy is not going to talk about this to his therapist. Okay, he might, but don't hold it against me. But <laughs> it's just, you know, they don't, kids don't need all that stuff. Spend time with them. Go for a hike. Think of ways to, you know, have an experience that doesn't cost money. I think as parents, especially working parents, there's that guilt that if we're not around all the time, we just throw stuff at them. And all that does is compound the debt. And especially if you come from a big family, maybe be the one that suggests, how about we draw names this year and we all get someone one gift. I guarantee if you do that, 40% of the people in the room are going to exhale and go, oh, thank God someone said it. Because if 78% of people are living paycheck to paycheck, count your family members that you buy Christmas presents for. That's how many people are going to be happy with the suggestions. But we just over materialize Christmas and we don't know that it was coming, which surprises me. <laughs> yeah, it's in December every year. I mean, you're really right because, you know, usually around Halloween, everyone starts going, oh no, I have eight weeks. And, right. and it like, ta-da, like all of a sudden we forgot that it happens at the same time every year. Also and when, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say, and that's one of the line items in my budget. I actually hold, technically I hold out for Christmas all year long. So out of every paycheck, like so much goes into like a bucket for Christmas. So it doesn't really matter if it's April or November when I'm buying gifts, I've got some money in the Christmas account to buy stuff. But again, I've planned for it. And that's the amount I have decided that we're okay spending, but really know what smart. your budget is and don't go so overboard just because you feel you have to, or it makes a great social media picture to have a tower of gifts. It It's not, you know, have a great experience with your family. And if you want to bless your kids, help them with their college in the future. Don't, you know, buy them the latest cool electronic when they're eight and won't remember. Yeah, absolutely. And when you think about families and they multiply and they grow and new people are added in and there's new spouses that get married in and then there's new nieces and nephews and cousins. And I mean, that's just, it just starts multiplying and it gets really, it gets really overwhelming. It's so stressful. And I hear time and time again, when I make that suggestion to people, so many will come back to me and go, Oh, do you know how many family members you know, thanked me for making the suggestion? I'm like, again, it's because nobody wants to talk about money, but I promise if you bring it up, someone's going to be really relieved and you may have helped them meet their budget that month because you made that suggestion to just draw names. I mean, we're adults. We don't need stuff. We don't need any more stuff. (laughs) Oh, Diana, this has been such uh, an enlightening conversation. And I love just how 
how open and honestly to me, just kind of airy this conversation has been around um, what can often feel like a really heavy topic. I'm curious, what, what does gutsy mean to you? Gutsy to me means doing it scared. And I don't know what the it is. It's whatever the it is in your life. But for me, there's a lot of things I've done over the years that have been way outside my comfort zone. And I just, I believe if you just do it scared, that's where the magic is. Because so many people want to wait. Oh, it's it's not the right time. I don't have enough money saved to do that. Well, just do it scared. It'll work out. That's so true. I love it. So I'm sure that you have piqued a lot of interest today. Um, so I'm curious, Diana, how can our listeners get in touch with you? How can they stay in touch? Um, and do you have any resources available? So I actually do have a closed Facebook group that I launched a few months ago just to help educate, motivate, and celebrate because I want everyone to talk about money. You know, I go live in it, give updates. I talked about insurance last night. Um, And that is Debt Free Diana, D-I-A-N-A, because I get Diane a lot and that's not my name. (laughs) Um, So they've got that. You're more than welcome. Like I said, just ask to add to join. I'll be happy to add you. And if you've got any questions or are looking for any um, one-on-one coaching, I am also at Diana, I'm sorry, Debt Free Diana at gmail.com. Fantastic. And I can attest, Diana does these really great Facebook live videos on very like specific topics. And it's just, it's like sitting across the table with a great friend talking about money. And it's, um, it's really fun. So thank you for doing that. And thank you for being here today. Thank you for being such a positive force, um, not just in the community, but in the world and, and honestly really just helping people alleviate some, some weight that, um, carries them around, uh, follows them around for a really long time. Absolutely. This has been awesome. And that is my goal to just help people find their hope. Life's too short. That's a true story. Join me this Thursday as we take our power back by taking care of some ongoing stuff. You know, that task that you really don't feel like doing, but you won't stop thinking about because you know, if you do this, the X, Y, and Z come into play. Well, this Thursday, we're going to talk about, let's just get it done. Until then, follow the Gutsy Podcast on Facebook and Instagram. And for more Gutsy Insight, follow me personally at that Laura Laura. See you next time.